With the ability to transport an army brigade of 3,000 troops and 7,500 tons of equipment within 96 hours, this colossal aircraft design would have put America's army right on the world's front door. And it couldn't be built fast enough, with the Pentagon ramping up the design to deliver a fleet of aircraft by the end of 2020. Its 500-foot wingspan would make it the largest military transport in the world, regulating the Antonov 225 to look like a regional jet. But the accountants at Boeing thought, why stop there? They came up with grand plans to change commercial and cargo aviation as well. But this future never happened, and the year 2020 came and went without the ultra plane gracing our skies. This is the story of the never built Pelican Super Transport. See this plane on the screen right now? This plane is carrying puppies and candy for all of my subscribers. See this jet with this missile? I'm gonna shoot down this plane if you don't subscribe. Because according to my analytics, only 11% of my viewers are subscribed. So if you're not subscribed, I'm gonna give you five seconds to click that red button, or I'm gonna shoot down this plane. Five, four, three, two, oh! Oh, there we go. It looks like one of you saved the day. So thank you so much for subscribing. Let's jump into the video. Pelicanus onocoronalis, or it's commonly known, the pelican. We have plenty of them here in my native Australia, as well as in most parts of the world. It may be an oddly shaped old bird, but there's something undeniably graceful even aerodynamic, about a pelican when it's lazily flying around coastal areas. It's no surprise that Boeing engineers came up with a ginormous aircraft akin to a seaplane inspired and designed with the pelican in mind. It was an aircraft set to take long-haul mass transit aviation to the next level. It was to be a numbers juggernaut in terms of scale and many aviation-related parameters. It was also a case of an aircraft design gone too far, or rather, simply too big. It would be called the Boeing Pelican Ultra, or the ultra-large transport aircraft named the Boeing Pelican Super Transport, was the brainchild of the Boeing Phantom Works, a division of the massive influential Boeing Corporation. The Boeing Pelican Ultra was initially intended to be a large capacity transport aircraft, initially for the military use, with potential thereafter as a commercial cargo or freight plane, which was set to fly in and out of the world's largest cargo centers. A project this huge in ambition and potential scope is deserving of an analysis. So let's take a closer look at the Boeing Pelican inspired Super Transporter. Design work on the Pelican Super Transport plane began at the Boeing Phantom Works in the year 2000. Boeing Phantom Works has an interesting history in itself. It was in fact founded by Boeing's rival, McDonnell Douglas, until it was bought out by Boeing. The primary focus of the Boeing Phantom Works is developing advanced military products and technologies into usable prototypes, and includes work for the military departments of allies such as Britain, Australia and India. Similar divisions would be the Skunk Works of Lockheed Martin, those guys who made the SR-72, and the Eagle Works at NASA. Projects on which the development Boeing division is known to have worked on include the Boeing Phantom Eye, a high-altitude long-endurance reconnaissance drone, the XS-1, a sub-audible space plane, and the Boeing A-160 Hummingbird helicopter. But many more of its projects to date have been top secret and highly classified. The Pelican Super Transport plane was one such project. The brief from the United States military was fairly straightforward. A design, a plane large enough to transport thousands of troops, weapons, military equipment, and other needed provisions during wartime or at the height of battle as fast as possible. By the way of comparison, one performance standard the military demanded would be the ability for the aircraft to deploy an army brigade of 3,000 troops and 
1,000 tons of equipment within 96 hours, or four days max, compared to the usual 91 to 183 days, or three to six months, that would normally be required to move these numbers of troops and equipment. Interestingly, the Boeing Phantom Works team considered at least three different possibilities. The first was a large blimp, or dirigible airship. The second, a smaller but wider airship that created dynamic lift while in forward motion. And the third, a larger airship with wings spanning 700 feet or 213 meters that would fly at a low altitude. All three designs were rejected. Also rejected by the team at Boeing were ideas for a fast ocean going ship and a sea based vehicle with a ground effect. Boeing Phantom Works then settled on a ground effect land based aircraft that would form the basis for the giant Pelican Super Transporter. It's important to note that the Pelican was not designed for contact with bodies of water, meaning it couldn't take off or land on any water surface. It would need a runway. Instead, it was designed to be lighter and more aerodynamic than other large planes of the seaplane variety. This was because the Pelican was able to exit ground effect to climb a few thousand feet and thus enter into its descent like any other aircraft. The Pelican's wingspan thereafter allowed the aircraft to fly beyond ground effect. This beyond ground effect, I keep saying, the capability of which the Pelican was unlike other massive ground effect aircraft, such as the Soviet Union's Kranoplan or the Caspian Sea Monster, which could only fly at low altitudes in order to maintain constant ground effect due to its relatively narrow wingspan. The Pelican would spend most of its time flying between 20 and 50 feet, or roughly 6 to 15 meters, above the surface, although it would have the all important ability to cruise at up to 20,000 feet, or 6.1 thousand meters, in order to avoid terrain or lower altitude weather. Its specifications also included a 500 foot or 152 meter wingspan, a wing area of over one acre, which is 43,000 square feet or 4,000 square meters, a maximum takeoff weight of 6 million pounds or 2.7 million kilograms, which is equal to seven and a half fully loaded Boeing 747s. It would also have a payload of 1.27 thousand tons of cargo and the ability to move the equivalent of 17 M1 Abrams tanks. So you can already see that unlike the other design proposals, this one was a winner right out of the gate. It was bigger, it could transport more, and it could fly over mountains and other large land masses where say the Soviet Union Akrana Plan ground effect designs definitely could not. The ground effect factor was a big selling point for the military, as Deborah Baron Radon the head of strategic development within Boeing Phantom Works said at the time, the Pelican is land-based, and that's where we're garnering most military support. It seems to have gained a lot of traction recently within the Defense Department. Whether or not there is a civil interest, our focus is on the military version for strategic deployment. By the way, the Pelican was conceptually also very simple. It was a massive, conventional, wing, body, tail, cantilevered, monoplane, whose payload would be carried in a standard sea-going containers inside the enormous unpressurized fuselage. That's right, the same containers that they use on cargo ships. The canaveral hull would be able to fit containers in too deep on the main deck, which would also be able to carry outsized vehicles, such as the military's large battle tanks. An upper level could be used to store further single layer of containers or be outfitted for passenger cabins. In short, the Pelican was to be a glorified hulk of a cargo plane. The Boeing division applied for a patent in October 2001. The design submitted for the patent illustrate features such as a T-tail, upward pointing, positive diahedral winglets, and a loading ramp at the back of the fuselage. Also in the design was an additional middle row of landing gears. Now you can already tell by this point in the story, 
Boeing was hugely proud of its Pelican design, referring to the plane in early 2002 as what would be the biggest bird in the history of aviation. No wonder Boeing said that the Boeing Pelican Super Transport would have dwarfed all other aircraft at the time, including what was then the world's current largest aircraft, Ukraine's AN-225, with the Pelican able to transport five times more than the Ukrainian aircraft's payload. And so the Boeing Pelican Super Transport was formally introduced to the public in July of 2002 at the Farnborough International Air Show. The design featured closely resembled the original painted design, although its winglets were now pointing upwards to attain maximized lift. However, at the show, Boeing also announced that the Pelican could fly only up to 2,000 to 3,000 feet, or 600 to 914 meters in altitude, with a wingspan of only 262 feet or 80 meters in width. Both these specifications were way below the eventual specifications of the Pelican that they had originally designed. On the other hand, the payloads that Boeing bragged about at the show were far bigger than the payloads that the Pelican was eventually set to handle. What the crowd saw of the Pelican Super Transport at the Farnborough Air Show that July day wasn't exactly the Pelican that later evolved and that the company would ultimately axe. Boeing would later brag that it was jointly studying the aircraft with the US Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, you know, the same crowd who mostly invented the internet as we know it today. Boeing also boasted that the US Army was evaluating the Pelican in war games in an effort to beat ships across the ocean, which was very big talk indeed. However, Boeing would eventually admit that the full concept studies for the Pelican would not commence for at least another 5 to 8 years, and that the aircraft would take at least 20 years before actually entering service. This would echoate to roughly sometime deep into the 2020s or beyond for the final versions to hit our airspace. It wouldn't be the first time that the Boeing Corporation was blowing hot air about one of its converted and much publicized projects. And you wouldn't believe what would happen next. By 2003, the Pelican was being showcased on the Boeing Phantom Works website and being presented by the division at High Tech Expositions. Boeing announced at the next Farnbo Air Show held in 2004 that the Pelican was already undertaking wind tunnel tests and the aircraft surface ceiling had increased from 20,000 feet to 25,000 feet or 7.6 thousand meters, meaning it could fly over most mountain ranges in the entire world. Its design was updated to be powered by 60 to 80,000 horsepower engines housed in four cantilever nacelles. It would also have four sets of contra-rotating propellers. Even more impressive was that the giant plane had the ability to fly non-stop across the Pacific Ocean, a big plus for the plane, whether as a military transport airship or as a commercial cargo plane of massive proportions. By the way, the Pelican would also need 76 wheels for its landing gear, just in order to distribute all of its immense weight. That is compared to most modern airliners that only have 6 to 10 wheels or even 18 used on the Boeing 747-400. The plane would also have no less than 38 fuselage mounted landing gears. It seems that the world was ready to finally usher in the new age of an ultra jumbo. So what happened? Things quite quickly deteriorated for Boeing's Pelican project. A big setback came in 2005 when a United States congressional report ranked the Boeing Pelican Super Transport as only the sixth out of 11th similarly military platforms be assessed for their feasibility. Congress gave the Pelican project a lower score due to the sheer scale and thus development and build cost of the aircraft, as well as its use of what Congress deemed to be high-risk technologies. Also, Boeing's ability to produce the aircraft in time for the requested 2015 deadline was in serious doubt. 
By April 2006, even Boeing wasn't making any public announcements about the Pelican, with internal memos showing that the corporation was instead focusing on low-cost and environmentally efficient passenger planes of conventional size, like the Boeing 787. Without much fanfare or even an official announcement, Boeing quietly discontinued any further development of its Pelican project, said to be sometime in late 2006. Some experts of the opinion that the Boeing Pelican was simply too expensive, too ugly, and too impractical for both the Boeing Corporation and the US military to give a green light and enter into production. Ah, that seems too unfair. Too expensive it may have been, but its practicality is debatable. After all, imagine a full potential of transport aircraft such as the Pelican during a war, or indeed as a commercial cargo gentle giant during peacetime. And as for not being beautiful, says who? I've seen some decidedly beautiful pelicans in my time, odd shaped and ungainly as they might be. So who's to say how beautiful the Boeing Pelican Super Transport may have looked flying in our skies? A new top secret fighter jet flies through the clouds. It can't be detected on radar until it's too late. Meet the original Flying Triangle or the Navy Stealth Fighter. You might think that you've seen enough Flying Triangle projects so far on this channel, but this one was unique and certainly cursed. It would be the new attack aircraft for the US Navy to rule the skies and the seas in the start of the 21st century, but would never be built and would prove to be the downfall for all the players involved. This is the Flying Dorito, the cursed A-12 Avenger 2. It's the late 80s, roller blades are cool and the Soviets are on the way out. And the US military was in the golden age of spending sweet taxpayer dollars on new military aircraft projects no matter how outrageous. Several projects were launched during this period with aesthetically sounding acronyms like ATF, ATB and JSF for the Air Force and the NATF and ATA for the Navy. And it's this last one that is the most insane. The ATA or Advanced Technology Aircraft Program. The Navy wanted to replace their aging A6s with a new state-of-the-art specialized attack aircraft that would have low observability, aka stealth. This jet would be able to approach enemy vessels or targets as close as 10 miles before being potentially detected, only if the enemy looked out the window. And it was certainly a tall order. Like all the government bids for these secret military projects, it was up to our usual suspects to come up with the jet of the future. McDonnell Douglas partnered with General Dynamics was on one side of the equation and their competitors were Northrop Grumman and Vought. During initial developments, both sides worked on a stealth aircraft much like the one used in the Air Force. But when it came to the deadline, only McDonnell Douglas submitted a bid for the project. Surprisingly, Northrop and friends didn't even submit a concept. It was simply too hard. And thus, the A-12 Flying Dorito was selected by default. So it's an easy victory, or perhaps the first red flag of a doomed program. McDonnell Douglas and General Dynamics were awarded with the contract in early 1988, with the requirements for the first flight of the prototype by late 1990s. Their design was very interesting indeed, but very on theme for the 80s and the stealth era. And needless to say, they definitely won the who's going to make a literal Dorito competition. It would be a triangle-shaped flying wing fuselage 
that would be crewed by two for the attack variant, specifically a pilot and weapons operator, but also had an option for a three-person crew, most likely for the electronic warfare version. The range of the A-12 was some 800 nautical miles or 1500 kilometers, which is pretty fantastic because the Super Hornet's combat range is around half of that. And if we're comparing it to other existing Navy aircraft, you can see that versus the F-14 and A-6, its wingspan would allow it to fit completely on the deck. In combination with its stealth design, it was starting to look a lot like the perfect superior fighter for the Navy. This is perfect. Everything's perfect. But it wasn't perfect. The weaponry was to be stored internally to remain stealthy and aerodynamic, meaning that the payload capacity was set to 2300 kilograms or 5160 pounds in freedom units. This would limit the choice for the missions because, for example, the most popular laser guided bombs in the Navy, like the GBU 24s, are some 2300 pounds, and JDAM is only around 2000 pounds. So the plane would only be able to carry around one or two large bombs, which is not a lot for a specialized attack aircraft. But no beauty is perfect and the Navy fell in love and would commission a series run of 620 aircraft and the Marines would follow up with a further 238. Unfortunately, they forgot that it is also a cursed flying triangle, and it would destroy all that touched the program. Literally. After one year of the program's prototype phase, there were three major problems. The first was that McDonnell Douglas had bit off a little bit more than they could chew, due to their not having enough experience with composite materials. This aircraft was severely overweight, how American of it, and I mean that because it was over 30% heavier than previously projected. And with aircraft carriers, weight is an extremely important factor due to the limited takeoff and landing areas on board. If you also include the limited issues with the weapons bay, this jet was starting to look like all bark and no bite. But that's nothing compared to the second issue. By late 1990, there was still no flying prototype and the whole production process was behind schedule with the big shots in the Pentagon getting nervous. Pressure was on to deliver a prototype and with the other programs actually delivering flying models, the Navy was hard pressed to explain why the ATA program was so far behind. But it's the final and third issue that would be the nail in the coffin of the program. The third and most important factor is that McDonnell Douglas blew through the budget and around $1 billion beyond the projection costs of the program. That's right, $1 billion. And believe me, this point is going to have further consequences down the line, but I'll get to that in a minute. Thanks to the giant hole in the Navy's budget, in 1991, the Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, killed the ATA program. The Department of Defense was very unhappy with the Navy's mess up, and because the ATA was so expensive and delayed, it actually took the life of the NATF program with it. It was also abandoned not long after. And you can hear all about that tragic story right here on the channel. But remember that I said that this was a cursed project and that everyone would be destroyed? Well, McDonnell Douglas and General Dynamics would be further sued by the US government for up to $2 billion because they didn't deliver the required aircraft and this led to the downfall of the entire legendary McDonnell Douglas company. The same company behind some of the most important and iconic aircraft in US aviation history. They're only out of this situation would to be bought up by Boeing. And Boeing, of course, would be the only one who profited in the end. Even though they lost the JSF program, the crippled Navy had to go for a budget option and modernize the FA-18, so this eventually led to the creation of the Super Hornet. 
The buyout of the company would of course mean that these executives would get cushy jobs at Boeing and would go on to influence their product line, such as moving the company away from the engineers and to Chicago. But I think that's an entire discussion that you can have in the comments. It would take another 24 years for this saga to play out when in 2014, both Boeing, being the new owner of the debt, and General Dynamics agreeing to pay only $200 million each to the US Navy for breaking the contract. And that's how the legendary TBF Avenger never got a successor in the A-12 and how the Navy learnt from their mistakes in the 90s, which led to some serious questions about money spendage. No, I'm just joking. They then go on to spend billions of dollars on the F-35, and it's all about that money changing hands, baby. But do you know what the real tragedy was? It's too bad that we never got to see the flying Dorito in action. But thank you guys and girls for watching today that we're able to use the power of computer technology to create the visual feast that you see here. Until we meet again, thanks for watching. Hidden in the clouds and invisible to radar is America's latest multi-role stealth jet. With its legendary status in the US Air Force and impressive air warfare record, the F-15 has been the backbone of the US Air Force and one of the most potent aerial combat platforms in the world. But a new era brings new challenges and the Silent Eagle was to bridge the gap between traditional 4th gen fighter designs and stealth. This is the story of how it went. After analyzing their experiences in both Vietnam and the Korean Wars, the US Air Force realized that they would need a dedicated fighter for future warfare. A page from the Soviet handbook. You see, unlike the F-4, which was more of a multi-role jet, Soviet MiGs were dedicated fighter jets, made to perform that role only and crush it. So this new FX program would set air superiority as its main goal. However, citing the new Soviet aircraft in 1967, the MiG-25 made this task much harder for the Americans. The US military was pretty scared of this Soviet boogeyman because, based on their research and the John Boyd maneuverability theory, this jet would be unmatched in air-to-air -air warfare due to its large wings, maximum speed, and presumed high maneuverability and thrust-to-weight ratio. The new F-15 would be made to this single goal, a dedicated fighter jet to counter the MiG-25 threat and dominate the skies. But their previous assessment of the Soviet threat turned out to not be really accurate at all. In 1976, Soviet defector Viktor Belenko gifted the West one MiG-25 and a big relief. The boogeyman wasn't that scary in their FX program, now the F-15 was far superior in almost every aspect. The MiG-25 was an interceptor, not a fighter. Oh, it was a flying brick in terms of maneuverability, although it was very, very fast. And this marked the beginning of a great and long career for the F-15. The F-15A and B and later C and D variants respectively served as the main US air superiority or heavy fighter up until the 21st century. But during the late 80s, a new variant of this jet, the F-15E, opened a whole new door of options as a true multi-role fighter. The F-15E would continue to be an invaluable asset in many operations, including Desert Storm, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Allied Force, to name a few. It was a right modification to the F-15 platform at the right moment. But as time went by, the playing field changed and set new rules and requirements, one of which would be stealth. The F-15C would be shadowed by the development and adoption by the US Air Force of the F-22 Raptor, the new king of the skies. And the 15E, although an amazing jet, had a couple of issues for the new state of modern warfare. 
First and foremost, it's radar cross-section. It was huge compared to other US aircraft. With a radar cross-section of 25 square meters, the F-15 is two times higher than its direct counterpart, the Su-27, five times higher than the MiG-29, and if we look at the other US jets, some 25 times higher than the Super Hornet. Yikes. For pilots of the F-15, it's like riding around in a giant bullseye. Another problem was its aging tech. While the F-15 is fantastic, it was developed back in the 80s and due to an upgrade if Boeing wanted to offer it to international customers. So to hit two birds with one stone, the engineers got cooking and came up with a surprising, nimble and crafty solution. The result? The F-15 Silent Eagle. Based off the production model of the F-15E, at first glance there were no serious changes, but that wasn't true at all. The first thing Boeing did was replace the CFTs or conformal fuel tanks with CWBs or conformal weapons bays. Fuel was out, firepower was in. This would keep the aerodynamic design the same as the proven 15E, but help it with the core issues that the F-15 had. This new CWBs would house two missiles each, either AMRAM or Sidewinders, and still allow for some extra fuel in the back to be stored. Another change were slightly canted vertical stabilizers compared to the original design. The F-15's vertical tails were 15 degrees outward and this helped a lot because the radar signature would slightly drop with tails not being parallel to each other and having 90 degrees to the fuselage. The Silent Eagle would also sport RAM panels or panels that were coated with radar absorbent material just like the F-22 and F-35. This paint would actually play a significant role in the mission of lowering the radar cross section of this jet just like the new F-16s and f 35 fives are being painted in this special, and forgive the layman term here, glass coat, and we can assume that the F-15 SE would receive the same treatment. But they wouldn't stop there. Boeing would also take the time to massively upgrade the systems on board the plane, making the Silent Eagle one of the most advanced fighters flying in the sky. This would range from a number of different electro-optical upgrades with the IRST to allow tracking enemy jets without the use of radar. It's something that the F-15E could do, but they had to have an external pod, so putting this inside would keep up with that stealth performance. Pilots would also be equipped with the new JHMCS helmets and new DUES or Digital Electronics Weapon Systems that was developed by BAE for this jet. There would also be a new fly-by-wire system developed for the Saudi F-15s that would be incorporated and it would receive brand new GE engines, allowing it to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a jet made this century. So in theory, all of this looked promising and this stopgap would possibly be the most advanced fourth generation fighter ever built. So why did we never get the stealthy F-15? When they announced it to the international market, several buyers immediately took great interest. South Korea was principally one of the main new customers for this jet, but as they begun negotiations, there were some questions raised about their own home ground aircraft industry. The development of their KF-21 jet was making great strides, and when they took less and less interest in the Silent Eagle, Boeing started to look for new customers. However, they weren't so lucky. Back on the home front, the US Air Force didn't want this new jet at the time, because this was 2010 here and nobody could even think about replacing the F-22s. And internationally, many buyers didn't want a jet this large and would look for a true fifth generation jet instead, the F-35, even though it was projected to cost almost double the F-15 SE. After a couple more years, Boeing decided to shelve the program, but they never quite let go, leading to a birth of something even better, the F-15 EX Eagle II. This jet will cover in a separate video, but suffice to say the saga of the F-15 is far from over and will continue to protect the skies of the United States for even decades to come. Looking to even reclaim the title of King of the Skies from even the mighty F-22 Raptor. 
Thanks so much for watching and be sure to subscribe and follow for the continuation of this video. The legend is back. If I told you 15 years ago that the future of the US Air Force would be the F-15, you probably wouldn't believe me and you would have unsubscribed right away. But how the tables have turned. The latest modification of the F-15 platform is set to fill in the gap of retired aircraft to protect American skies for decades to come. And in a strange twist, might even replace the pretty much brand new F-22 Raptor. Why was it chosen and how did Boeing make one of the best 4 plus gen aircraft that just seems to keep giving, leading us to think the future of the US Air Force is actually in the past? The US Air Force has a problem. With the termination of the F-22 program some time ago, subsequent news of retirement by 2030s and insane ongoing F-35 costs, there is simply no way to tick all the boxes in the budget and maintain the US Air Force aircraft fleet long term. Another issue is the existing aging fleet of F-15C and Ds, and even Strike Eagles that are some 30 years old now and the US is still using them to protect its skies. The Russian Air Force started to replace their Su-27s a long time ago with the latest Su-35s and Su-30SMs, but America seems to have been caught with its pants down. They haven't started such a program themselves because the F-35 was supposed to be the jack of all trades to replace almost all aging aircraft in the combined armed forces. However, at an astronomical cost to the US taxpayer. Fortunately, there is one US airframe maker that knows a thing of two about pitching old aircraft as new. Cough Cough 737 MAX. Boeing saw an opportunity and offered the Air Force its best aircraft, proven in combat and well known by the pilots and support crew. Now with an updated, well, everything. To understand how we got here, let's go back a bit and see the path that the Eagle took to get to the EX or Eagle 2 variant. During the 90s, the right modification at the right time was developed for the F-15 platform calling it the F-15E or Strike Eagle. The multi-role variant of the jet based off a two-seater with added CFTs or conformal fuel tanks for extended range, new, more powerful engines and capabilities to perform ground attack missions. The F-15E was the backbone of all major operations in the US Air Force throughout the past 30 years and proved to be an invaluable asset in each one of them. But with the stealth hysteria and 5th gen jets being developed that can shoot over the horizon without even looking at the enemy, the C and D variants made for air superiority were starting to become obsolete. So then Boeing came up with a proposal to overcome the gap between the 4th and 5th gen fighters with the F-15 SE or Silent Eagle that we've already covered in another video right here on the channel, a stealth version of our favourite plane. That project was not successful, but the idea was there. Eagle had more to offer, it just wasn't the right time. By 2001, the last F-15 was delivered to the US Air Force. You might think that that's the end of the tale, but the key factor is that exports of this jet kept the production line open. It had active production throughout the next two decades, with many customers overseas also paying for new upgrades such as engines and avionics. So the entire airframe was constantly upgraded. With a still active line and support available, the project was ready to be resurrected. The F-15 EX or Eagle II is on first glance just the Strike Eagle with a fancy new name. But if we take a look below the hood, it's much, much more. It's based off the F-15E design, or more precisely, the latest export variant, the QA, keeping the CFTs. However, the engines have been majorly overhauled with the Pratt & Whitney ones thrown out with a slightly more powerful General Electric one replacing them. This version would be based on the two-seater variant, even though the National Guard wanted a single-seater for their fleet, 
Alas, this request was denied because the single-seater production line was closed a long, long time ago. But Boeing, not wanting to lose a customer, got around this by making the flight controls so that one pilot can fly the aircraft without anyone else in the back seat. Visual changes are also the exhaust nozzles, so-called turkey feathers, on new engines and pods on top of the stabilizers that are now the same size. On the current aircraft, there are also two bumps near the cockpit, but these are only present because they are literally QA variants with some components that are exclusive to US aircraft. In short, these bumps are actually empty. One of the major internal upgrades compared to its predecessor is fly-by-wire system, which allows for a further two hardpoints under the wings that were not present on previous variants because of the instability in flight that would make flying the jet almost impossible with analog controls. So thanks computers for taking on this burden. The Eagle 2 also received a now upgraded radar, which combines the processor from the Super Hornets radar with a new large antenna, giving our protagonist threat detection range of up to 400 kilometers. It's also been upgraded so it can both scan and jam enemy frequencies at the same time. One of the sensors present on the latest exponent variants for Qatar and Saudi Arabia are not present on the EX at the time, but might be integrated later down the line. All of this is nice and all, but with a huge radar cross-section in the stealth jet era and the F-35 being just out there, what was even really the point of all this hard work? Let me explain. Waiting with a hushed breath is the new air superiority fighter that will come after the F-22 is retired, called the Next Generation Fighter, and it's currently being developed at the moment. But this plane will only enter service during the 2030s and will have full operational capability with serial production sometime after that into the future. We've done a video on that as well, so be sure to check that out. Meanwhile, there is not a single air superiority fighter left in the United States Air Force. Mind you, the F-35 is an amazing jet, but it's a multi-role jet made leaning towards ground attack missions, like the F-16 is. And with a very small payload, it's not suitable to counter heavy enemy fighters in defensive scenarios like the Russian Su-35s, Su-57s, or Chinese J-16s and J-20s. The Eagle II, however, is the perfect answer to this role. With a further extended payload capacity of an insane 29,000 pounds, it can be a true spam ram carrier and further carry oversized missiles and bombs that the much smaller F-35 can, such as hypersonic missiles currently in development. Also, in uncontested airspace, when in a ground attack configuration, the F-15EX can perform various tasks much more cost effectively than an F-35. Another thing to consider is that the F-15EX will join mostly National Guard squadrons and have the task of protecting the airspace back at home. But there is yet another big factor at work here. Money. Money! 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 Although not much cheaper than the F-35, the maintenance cost and flight hour cost is way below the F-35. To put this in perspective, if the US Air Force bought F-35s instead of the F-15EXs, they wouldn't be able to operate the whole fleet at the same time. One more selling point for the new Eagle is the projected lifespan of 20,000 flight hours, which is absolutely insane. That would definitely put the Eagle as the longest serving military aircraft in the history of the United States Air Force. Currently 144 airframes have been ordered with an option of 200 total, but that's enough to replace the entire F-15CD fleet, but there are some talks for some time now for a further 200 to be bought which would push the total number up to 400 jets. That's an insane number of F-15s. So yeah, the Eagle is back and it's here to stay, screeching into combat for decades to come and defend the skies of the US of A. Thanks so much for watching today's video and don't forget to check out our new merch store that's online and I'll see you in the next video. You know the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, but you might not know its ugly ducking cousin that was once almost the future of the US Air Force. Meet the production model Boeing F-32. 
Boeing's entry into the JSF program was a bold move to win the largest military contract in both the United States and aviation history in general ever conceived. Was this aircraft actually better than its counterpart, or was the aesthetics that proved to be the nail in the coffin for one of the most controversial programs of the 90s and early 2000s? Let's take off vertically with the story of the Boeing X-32 fighter jet. This week on my other channel, I have a video about the Nazi Sun Gun, a super weapon that the Nazis designed to evaporate New York. Check it out after this video, link down below. Welcome to the 90s. The Iron Curtain has fallen and life is good. Well, at least in the West. Yesterday you said you'd call Sears. I'll call today. You call now. Now's the time to save on Sears installed central air conditioning. However, a new age brings new threats and the US needs to be ready to counter them, whatever they end up being. The JSF or Joint Strike Fighter Program was created to complement the ATF program which led to the birth of the F-22 Air Dominance Fighter. The JSF idea was to create a new multi-role fighter for both the Navy and the Air Force because of the demise of the A-12 Avenger and the NATF programs which you can watch both of those videos right here on the channel depending of course how far in the future you are. This new JSF aircraft was to replace the A-10, F-16, F-A-18, the AV-8 Harrier and the F-117. A truly ambitious project to build the last fighter jet the United States would ever need. Our usual suspects, Lockheed, Boeing, Northrop and McDonnell Douglas applied for the program, but it was Boeing and Lockheed who received $750 million each to develop the two demonstrators. We will have to cover the other programs another day, so if you want to see that, then consider subscribing. Each was asked to create two aircraft, a classic fighter for the Air Force and the other was to be a short takeoff and vertical landing capable jet for the Navy and the Marines. Interesting side note, the government actually prohibited the companies to further fund the prototype's development to limit the production costs and ensure that they don't go bankrupt themselves chasing after this contract. Lockheed would actually come up with the X-35 and Boeing made, well, this thing called the X-32. The game was on. The design philosophy behind the X-32 was very interesting. Boeing took seriously the requirement to cut the production costs for future aircraft and made a couple of design choices to make it cheaper that would ultimately come back to haunt them. The first was its delta wing. To cut the manufacturing costs and simplify the design, they opted for a large delta wing without the folding mechanism. And instead the X-32B's wingspan was just a bit larger than the Hornet's with wings folded. The second choice was to go for a thrust vectoring nozzle instead of the lift fan like the X-35 for its short takeoff and vertical landing variant and followed the same principal design as the Harrier jump jet. The lift fan along with the foldable nozzle which the X-35 and F-35 uses today was much more complicated but proved to be a superior solution which we'll talk about in a second. It's interesting to mention how it was the Russians who tried this successfully with the Yak-141 not long before, which is a future video so no spoilers. But there was one other so-called ugly design feature of the X-32 that was the most controversial. Well, there's a sound explanation for that wide open grin. As we previously mentioned, the X-32 didn't use a lift fan, so to operate in hover mode it was designed with a large front intake that had to suck in a lot of air. And because who was president at the time, it was given the nickname Monica. 
which because this is a family friendly channel, I won't dive into. Anyway, this opening grin would keep the compressor blades exposed and this was an issue for the stealth performance of the aircraft. A possible solution to this problem would have been radar wave blockers inside the intake, just what the Russians did on their Su-57, but at the time they didn't have that technology developed. Another reason for that ugly big air intake was the engine, unlike the X-35 as well as pretty much every other fighter, was mounted slightly forward. So the center of gravity was moved as well and the bulky and weird design was the only solution to keep the aircraft stable during hovering and flight. But this jet was smiling about something because there was an upside with having such a large and bulky design. The weapons bay. It could fit up to six AMRAM missiles or a combination of AMRAMs and sidewinders. Basically, although very weird, the design made sense because it would be much cheaper and simpler to maintain than the X-35 and could have a ton more firepower. With the price right and the design flaws figured out, how could it possibly lose? The problem, turns out, was in the name of the program, Joint Strike Fighter. As the name suggests, it was a program where both the Navy and the Air Force were looking for new aircrafts. So both set their own requirements and parameters for the new aircraft. Eight months into the development of these jets, the Navy actually updated their requirements and this is where that part about the X-32 design choices coming back to haunt the engineers comes into play. The Delta Wing with a rather small wingspan couldn't fulfill the needs of the Navy and Boeing proposed a new tail design as well as adding horizontal stabilizers for the X-32. 32B, the VTOL variant, but there wasn't enough time to implement these changes and they had to fly out both demonstrators and present them to officials. And that leads us to our video here today with the 3D model that shows the different production models with further design changes that would have been implemented if Boeing had enough time. Is it just me or was it actually looking much better than the test version? Let me know down in the comments what you think. In 1999, both the X-32A and B were presented to the public and the first flight of the X-32A happened in the year 2000. Both prototypes with the X-35 were powered by Pratt & Whitney YF-119 engines, the same engine used to power the YF-22 and 23. These Navy design changes push back the first flight of the VTOL variant, the XB-32B, where it had its first flight in 2001. Although the flight performance was fine with even the Chase F-18 Hornet failing to keep up with the jet, the issue was actually with overheating when hovering and landing due to the intake sucking in hot air from in front instead of cold air from above the aircraft, like the X-35 and its lift fan could. In the end, the X-35 proved to be a superior aircraft at the time, and today we all know how the F-35 story went and how complicated and ill-fated its development was with extreme budget overruns and problems with some of the original partners of the project. So we can only really speculate if the X-32 would have at least fulfilled the cost parameters since its design was based all around it. In the end, even though both aircraft exceeded the expectations of the program, it was that heat issue with the VTOL system of the Boeing X-32 that made it lose the race against the X-35. Although, according to some, it was a perfectly fine fighter. There are also stories that the X-32 was just not looking like a serious fighter jet, rather like a flying bathtub, and we can all agree that the F-35 is one sexy looking jet nowadays. So perhaps the powers that be were simply embarrassed by what the plane looked like. But perhaps that would have been its secret weapon. Imagine enemy fighter pilots seeing it in combat and either bursting out laughing or having to look away whilst the X-32 shoots them down easily. 
but I think I admit that even Tom Cruise wouldn't be able to make this plane look cool. But jokes aside, per the words of the lead test pilot Philip Yates, updated production model design would have satisfied the rest of the requirements set by the government and it might have made a fine fighter plane for America and its allies. Lockheed's initial design, on the other hand, was very similar to the production variant. Its legacy, at least with Boeing, is in its technological developments that were achieved during the construction of the aircraft, which were later used for that very lucrative Super Hornet deal that the Boeing scored with the Navy. And the Super Hornet definitely is a good looking aircraft. So that's the story of the design and development of the Boeing's X-32. I hope you enjoyed this little video and don't mind me roasting it a little bit. Until the next one. The YF-23 was the main competitor to the legendary F-22 Raptor, or at the time, the YF-22, in a contest to create the future air dominance fighter for the 21st century and counter Soviet Sukhois. Despite the YF-23 surpassing the Raptor in some of the aspects and requirements set by the government, ultimately, it wasn't the winner. To answer why and look into more detail behind the jet we never got, strap yourself in and hold on tight and meet the Black Widow 2. When first sighting the new Soviet aircraft on satellite imagery in 1978, the US was worried. New Su-27 and MiG-29s were direct competitors to the F-15C and the question of air dominance was back on the table. The government started a new program called the ATF or Advanced Tactical Fighter with several famous American aircraft manufacturers applying for the job. By the late 1986, it was decided that Lockheed Martin would develop one prototype and Northrop, along with McDonnell Douglas, the guys behind the F-15, AH-64 and many other legendary US aircraft, would start working on the other one. They were given a deadline of four years and told to come up with the very best to defend American airspace. The game was on. Northrop opted for a completely new and innovative design with some of the elements borrowed from already known and proven concepts. Two of the signature design decisions with the YF-23 were its diamond-shaped wings and movable V-shaped tail. There were no horizontal stabilizers, rather the tail surfaces would help steer the aircraft as they were tilted 50 degrees to each side. They would help provide both pitch and yaw during the flight, with the pitch by rotating in the opposite direction and the yaw by rotating in the same direction. It's interesting to note that the Russian Su-57 borrowed this design, although they did keep horizontal stabilizers on it and vertical ones weren't as angled as they were with the YF-23 prototype. Pratt & Whitney were selected by the commission to develop new engines for both the prototypes, and they allowed them supersonic cruise speed without afterburners, a very important factor that affects the fuel consumption and therefore the range and obviously the speed of the aircraft. And it's something that the Russians are struggling to this day to develop. Anyway, the YF-23 was to be faster than the YF-22, but lacked thrust vectoring control in the engine nozzles, while the exhaust itself was made up with special materials to dissipate heat, helping the aircraft maintain its stealth capabilities. Now while we're at it, the YF-23 was actually a stealthier aircraft than the YF-22, which as we all know, led to the F-22, which is extremely stealthy and hasn't been surpassed in performance to this day. And there are a few reasons why this was the case. Another thing that helped the Black Widow 2 was the design of the intakes. The engines were positioned slightly higher than the intakes on the front, so this would allow the S-shaped intakes and compressor blades to be completely hidden. 
This is very clever because you see, in normal circumstances, radar waves can deflect in a way that would allow the operator to detect the aircraft more easily. And this choice again helped the low radar signature performance of the YF-23 beat the F-22. The internal bay was able to also carry up to six air-to-air -air missiles with possible hardpoints on the wings, just like the F-22 we have today. However, the YF-23 only had one weapons bay in the mid-lower fuselage, unlike the F-22, which has two smaller ones carrying AIM-9Xs. So with this long list of specifications and the stealth potential that it had, why was it not selected? You see, the first prototype of the YF-23 took to the skies in 1990 and was nicknamed the Black Widow 2 in honor of the Northrop P-61 Black Widow, the first aircraft to use actual radar on board. And funny trivia for that first YF-23 prototype was that it was painted in dark gray, almost a black color with the red hourglass painted on the lower fuselage, just like a mark that the Black Widow Spider in real life has. When the management found out about this, they insisted that the marking should be removed and that the second prototype was called the Gray Ghost. But we all know that the Black Widow is a much cooler name. Anyway, by this time the Berlin Wall fell and the Cold War was slowly ending. A couple of years forward and the US was sure that by this point that even the whole fifth generation program was kind of useless because it didn't have any serious threats to fight anymore. But the US military, or perhaps the US military industrial complex, had a little bit of an egg on their face. They had already spent so much taxpayer dollars on these two prototype jets that they had to go ahead with at least one. And the YF-23, although surpassing the YF-22 in stealth capability and some other aspects, lacked one important thing. High agility. As we all know, the F-22 is a very agile aircraft and in the now days of a rather small chance of a dogfight with a modern Russian fighters like the Su-35 or Su-30, it would certainly be an extremely dangerous opponent. On the other hand, the YF-23 wouldn't. Thus, the decision was made in 1991 and the YF-22 was to become the winner of the ATF program eventually getting its name, the F-22 Raptor. You see, by this time, air combat was moving more and more towards the focus of BVR, but dogfighting was still a realistic scenario, and the current jets that the Russians were using by 1991, the Su-27 and the Flanker family, are still probably some of the most agile aircraft made to this day. So the US didn't want to be left with its pants around its ankles when the Russians came knocking. Of course, there are many other reasons why this jet was chosen over the other one, mainly politics and money. But in my opinion, this agility issue was one of the most important factors that led to the YF-22 being chosen over the YF-23. But this wasn't the end for the Black Widow. At least, not yet. In parallel to the Air Force, the Navy was also looking for a fancy new toy and the Navy Advanced Tactical Fighter Program was also looking for a new stealth 5th gen aircraft that could be used with aircraft carriers, obviously. After losing the Air Force contract, Northrop flipped over and went to the Navy and applied for the Navy program with their YF-23, although they now called it the NATF-23. This version would be slightly different from the main thing. It would sport canards, different exhaust nozzles, folding wings, and a reinforced landing gear, along with a landing hook and all the gear needed for those crazy Navy pilots to crash land it without actually crashing it on an aircraft carrier's deck. We'll certainly cover this concept in a future video if there's enough interest, so please let me know down below. 
There are also some rumors recently about Japan using a lot of information and even getting Northrop involved to help them develop their new fifth or even sixth generation aircraft. And that gives us hope that we'll at least see a similar looking jet sometime in the future. So there goes the story behind one of the best looking aircraft in history, one that looks futuristic even today and would definitely turn heads on an air show while turning also enemy planes into fireballs. So press F in the comments for the YF-23. Smash that like button like the government smashes funds into crazy aircraft projects and hit the subscribe button like a AE ram hitting an enemy jet on the horizon. Thanks for watching, over and out. If you think you've seen everything with the experimental YF-23, you're wrong. There was one other design. It was to be the Navy's fifth gen multi-role aircraft. Stealthy, maneuverable, and ready to hit that highway to the danger zone. But it would face political opposition, technical challenges, and even Lockheed trying to steal the future jet crown for the second time. Join me today on the story of the aircraft that Maverick should have flown in the latest Top Gun and why we never got it. This is the incredible NATF 23. Without spoiling the Top Gun Maverick for anybody who hasn't seen the movie yet, Maverick and his band of elite Navy pilots fly the Super Hornets in the latest Top Gun sequel. Seriously, just go watch it. It has the official found and explained stamp of approval. And for those who watched it and might be asking yourself how it could have been better, well, today I have the answer. Our story begins with the Air Force's Advanced Tactical Fighter Program, or ATF, that was launched during the late 80s to create America's first fifth gen aircraft, with the YF-22 and YF-23 being the main competitors. The YF-22 would end up taking the edge and becoming what we know today is the F-22 Raptor. I have a full video on the YF-23 and this contest right here on the channel, which you can watch right now. Now, but there was a footnote to this story. Northrop wasn't going to accept the loss and went over to the Navy with a proposal that could have changed everything. The Navy was looking for a fifth generation aircraft for themselves to replace the aging F-14 Tomcats and a jet that could be the spearhead for the future of the Navy Air Force. But requirements for the naval aircraft are far different than a regular Air Force jet, so the YF-23 in its original form wasn't going to fit the bill. Instead, several very significant modifications were to be done to the fuselage, almost creating a completely new aircraft, barely resembling its predecessor. But Northrop wouldn't be the only company pitching to the Navy. Of course, by 1990, when the Navy officially launched the NATF program, Lockheed had heard about it and was also in on the race. They presented their own version of the F-22 Raptor for the Navy, which would be the main competition for the NATF-23. And thus, the showdown of the future Navy jet was on. For Northrop to beat Lockheed at their own game, the engineers needed to not only reach the technical requirements of the Navy's future aircraft, but to utterly smash them in such a way that nobody would think twice. Exactly what the Lockheed F-22 Raptor had done to steal the contract away from Northrop only a few years earlier. This new aircraft, unlike the original YF-23, followed a different design philosophy, and although horizontal stabilized 
fuselages were missing, as with the original, large canards were added to the front of the fuselage to help control and maneuver the aircraft. We can say with fair certainty that there was more versions of this design, but more on that in a minute. Wings were now larger because naval aircraft require larger wing and flap areas for operating from an aircraft carrier, and were foldable to operate on aircraft carriers. Vertical stabilizers were not as angled as with the original, but still had no rudders, and instead moved as one hole with a very similar sawtooth design choice on the back, probably to lower the RCS or rear cross section from certain angles. Although still sporting S ducts, engines were now positioned much lower than on the YF-23 and had a centered position compared to the forward fuselage. Note here one very interesting detail. Often it's said how influence Russia's Su-57 is by the F-22 design, but instead we should look elsewhere and it's actually the YF-23 and its naval variant which the Ruskies borrowed some solutions from. The shape of the hump behind the canopy is quite similar to the NATF-23 design, and if we have a look at the side profile, the forward fuselage design is obviously heavily inspired by the YF-23. What a coincidence. The NATF-23 had the same weapons bay positioned as the YF-23 with additional hardpoints on the wings for either additional fuel or weapons capability. And you in the audience who commented on the YF-23 video might know where this is going. With confidence that they had made the superior jet, Northrop presented it to the Navy. It would end up taking a very long time for the Navy to get their 5th gen jets, namely the F-35C variant. This is over 20 plus years later and still the Super Hornet remains the backbone of the Navy, with their future service prolonged beyond 2030 for the current aircraft with new Block 3 aircraft ordered only last year. So clearly in retrospect, the NATF-23 was perfect and desperately needed by the Navy. What happened? When looking at the designs, the Navy pointed out some flaws. One of the issues with the NATF-23 were the canards, because normally they increase the cross-section and we don't want that with a stealth aircraft. Northrop would actually make another version to fix this flaw, which actually went through tunnel testing. The model that you can see displayed in St. Louis and was donated by none other than Boeing in the early 2000s. And clearly this design didn't have any canards. Another problem was the weapons bay, which was very limited in capacity and had a complicated design as the original, while aircraft like the FA-18E and F are well known to have large payload capability for their role as both fighter and attack aircraft. In some cases, a single missile jam could result in the entire NAFT-23 being unable to deploy its payload, a flaw that shockingly the engineers didn't try to fix from the original YF-23 proposal. So the role of the NATF-23 would be inclined to be a specialized fighter rather than a multi-role jet that the Navy needed. And with that stealth issue and limited complex weapons bay, there would have been many compromises. But that wasn't actually the main reason why the Navy passed. Another thing that influenced the demise of the NATF program was the A-12 Avenger, which was cancelled in 1991 along with the NATF because the Navy spent so much money. They almost blew their entire budget for the rest of the decade by early 1991. Northrop probably lost the ATF program too because of the issues with the costs and delivery of the B-2 bombers, and both the Air Force and the Navy weren't pretty happy to deal with them anymore. So you can blame a mix of budgetary requirements, politics, and interesting design choices. The Navy ended up with the most rational and cheap option, to deeply modernize the F-18C and create an almost completely new aircraft based on its design, which would fulfill the roles they needed in the years to come. And boy, they did.
So yeah, there's not a lot of info floating around about the details of the NATF program, but I do hope that this video was interesting for you, dear viewers, and I'll meet you in the next one. The future of helicopter transport is here, with comically large rotors and... Oh wait, hold on. Is this a plane or a helicopter? Well, actually, my friends, this is called a coaxial helicopter, and being as fast as an aeroplane is just the beginning. It's far more stable, can carry more, and is nearly invisible on radar. And it's the latest specialty dish from the kitchen of legendary Sikorsky and Boeing, with a chef kiss dash from Lockheed Martin. And it's so good that it went head to head against Bell's V22 2.0 for the replacement of the legendary Blackhawk. But despite ticking all of the boxes with celebrity parents, it failed to win the hearts and minds of the US military. This leaves us asking, is this aircraft a strong competitor for the future of the Army and the Marine Corps, or just another museum piece of a what if world? Let's find those answers, spin up the rotors, and climb aboard the SB-1 Defiant. Why was the SB-1 such a cutting-edge aircraft? Regular helicopter design suffers from two fatal flaws, slow and unstable. With a speed of around 350 to 400 kilometers per hour, the fastest helicopters in the world are slower than pretty much any aeroplane. On the other hand, a helicopter requires a tail rotor because while spinning, the main rotor creates a counterforce pushing the fuselage in the other direction, and that the tail rotor is needed to counter that force and allow for stability in flight. You lose the tail rotor, you're spinning uncontrollably and falling down hard. The Soviet Karmov Bureau were the first to solve this problem with coaxial rotor designs on their helicopters. By having a second rotor spinning in the opposite direction on top, you eliminate the force pushing against the fuselage, and as a bonus, you also have slightly more lift. This design also removes the tail rotor out of the equation and makes the aircraft much safer and much more maneuverable. That's imbalance fixed, but the issue of speed persists. The British have tried with their Rotodyne, as well as the Soviets with their Car 22, to incorporate both rotors and engines that would push the aircraft forward, breaking that speed barrier. But their solution was inefficient, complicated, and still not fast enough. However, in the late 1970s, Sikorsky had an idea that would solve both of these issues, and that idea came to life as the XH-59. By combining coaxial rotor design with additional jet engines, one could get an extremely fast but also stable and safe aircraft, and this is exactly what Sikorsky did. Powered by one turboshaft engine for the rotors and two additional turbojets, the XH-59, also known as the S-69, <laughs> could reach the speed of up to 487 kilometers per hour. It was stable in flight, and in case of engine failure, it could still use its coaxial rotors to land safely. But even though they had solved two problems, the result had created a third. Three engines, out of which two were turbojets, would guzzle fuel very fast, and the range was then very limited on a helicopter of small dimensions. There wasn't any room to add a bigger fuel tank. Therefore, the project was put in a drawer and left to gather dust for a long time, nearly 30 years to be exact. But then, the US Army came knocking and said, we want a new helicopter, and we want a lot of them. And yes, you know the engineers had dollar signs in their eyes and pulled out their favorite money-making design. The US government had started something called the Future Vertical Lift Program. The FVL program would be the biggest contract issued by the US Army and the Marines in the last 50 years. Its goal was to create a series of new helicopters which were going to perform both combat, transport, and recce reconnaissance roles, all whilst sharing as many components as possible. As part of that program, the military was also intending to retire the legend itself, the 
the UH-60 Blackhawk and replace it with this new aircraft. The military thus turned to two of the very best helicopter manufacturers in the States, Bell with their V-280 Valor concept and Sikorsky now under the Lockheed management paired with Boeing to create this new state-of-the-art helicopter. Sikorsky Boeing brought to the table the SB-1 Defiant and while they claimed it to be a completely original design, we know that it's pretty much based off the S-69 from the 70s and their subsequent X-2 prototype, although there are some major changes. The size of the aircraft is not much larger than the Black Hawk, although it is powered by two 5000 HP engines giving it some 50% more power than the Blackhawk. The coaxial rotor design also removes the need for the tail rotor, but there is now a pusher propeller right there, giving the helicopter a much higher maximum speed. This propeller is powered by the same engines powering the main rotors, the Honeywell T55s, the same ones that were used on the Chinook. And not to spoil anything, these engines were actually just a temporary solution but I'll get to that in a second. Looking inside, we can see that the fuselage is more spacious than the Black Hawk and therefore much more optimized as a medivac or troop carrier. The SB-1 also had fly-by-wire controls and a very modern cockpit with large MFDs and a crew of four, a pilot, a co-pilot, and two gunners. The design itself resembles an aeroplane's much more than a helicopter with a streamlined fuselage and large horizontal control surfaces and movable tails acting as rudders. Flash forward to 2019, the SB-1 took to the skies for the first time and it was actually very good. Dozen of tests were carried out including the emergency scenario where one engine was shut down and the helicopter performed with flying colors showing great maneuverability, safety and performing well even in low altitude tests. It had a maximum speed of 465 km per hour which was the minimum program requirements for the army. But it wasn't just the army that was buying this new helicopter, but the marines as well. And these gun-ho soldiers brought to the table some eye-watering requirements of their own. And wouldn't you know it, it was range again. Throughout this video, I've said that the SB-1's design fixed the flaws of the regular helicopter, but there was actually another solution. A tilt rotor helicopter. This was a design that was well studied and already existed. And we even had the V-22 Offspray flying in the skies by none other than rival Bell. And it was exactly this design that they brought to the program, the V-280 Valor. It was pretty much a V-22 2.0, so to speak. Learning from all the hardships and problems with the V-22, which had developed a reputation as a rather unsafe aircraft, they made this new version much better, easily breaking the 500 km per hour barrier and bringing the range to match, surpassing the requirements set even by those Marines, which was double that of the Army. The range requirements that the SB-1 struggled with. The Valor would have a cruising speed of 280 knots or 520 kilometers per hour and hence the name V-280 and this falls right into both the Army and the US Marine Corps minimal requirements but its top speed is around 550 kilometers an hour when you actually push it to the metal that meets even the most ambitious design requirements of the Marines. Sikorsky and Boeing were not going to take this lying down and were very quick to respond to these results with their own improved version of the SB-1, now called the Defiant X. They explained that these engines that they had inside the aircraft, the old T-55 ones from the Chinook, were not the ones to be used in the final design, and that the new engines on the way would give an additional 50% to both the range and the maximum speed. They would also take the time to make another change in the fuselage, incorporate hidden exhausts, like on the RAH-66, lowering the thermal signature and a more angled body to somewhat reduce its radar cross-section. 
The landing gear was also changed to a standard tricycle scheme, however that vertical fin wheel was kept probably as an extra precaution as to not damage the fin during landing in bad weather conditions. They even overhauled the interior, getting some new flight controls from Collins Aerospace, including a brand new state-of-the-art Paragon computer, which is going to be used on many future aircraft programs. Alas, it seemed to be all for naught. The aircraft might have ticked all the boxes, but the SB-1 looked lackluster next to the Valor. The Army and Marines decided that they had found their future helicopter. But why? Why did the military choose it? The answer is actually quite simple. There is a ready solution to the V-280, unlike a possible future solution with the SB-1. The V-280 was the future today with its current engines and didn't need any new technology or engineering that were on the horizon for the SB-1. And thus, they won the contract. Sikorsky and Boeing protested this decision, but they were rejected by the Government Accountability Office. And it's rather funny when you think about it that Sikorsky fell into the classic Soviet futuristic project death spiral, where an ingenious solution is made, but due to the engines not being ready in time, the project as a whole falls into a heap. So is the SB-1 going to become a museum piece, or is there still some hope left for the project? As we mentioned, the FLV is a huge program and it branches into many different projects. That's right, it's time for round two. And believe it or not, the two competitors in the future air attack reconnaissance aircraft, or FARA, are Bell and Sikorsky. Sikorsky Boeing's proposal is under the name of Radar X, a very fancy design, but it is very similar to the same design as the Defiant. Especially interesting for a combat aircraft that needs survivability as one of its important factors, something that the SB-1 shines at. Bell, of course, is coming to the table with a proposal called the Invictus. Jesus, where are they coming up with these names? Like we're in some sort of supplement store. The Invictus protein with a new 20% better formula for extra gains. Jokes aside, Invictus follows the same old helicopter design with a tail rotor and might prove inferior this time to the SB-1 derivative radar. So there is hope that the Sikorsky Boeing might get a large piece of that sweet taxpayer's cake. The SB-1 design is actually much more suitable for a smaller type of aircraft and can't really be upscaled much more. And this is another reason why its transport role might have not been the optimal one, but maybe a combat variant is the real future of this program. And honestly, I really wish I only had one. I just think it's neat. Thank you so much for watching and let me know if you want to see a story on the V280 Vela or out supplement named heroes for future combat aircraft. Until then, enjoy your week and I'll see you in the next one.